Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to God for your president. I think he's a marvelous leader and an inspiration to many of us, including myself, and I am so grateful. I also would <coughs> like to apologize to uh, Judy. She's done such a wonderful job in keeping us all straight, and difficulty about that is that um, I've kept changing the title of my talk, um, <laughs> and I've changed it once more. Um, but before I get into that, I do want to say how, what a personal uh, delight and privilege it is to be with you. Um, I don't suppose there's anyone in this room that hadn't been deeply hurt by uh, events in the church um, in the past uh, two or three decades. And I think that we have each lost several friends and yet, I've gained some friends. <laughs> and I'm so grateful and so many of you are here today and I'm really appreciative of it. I can't name them all because I might leave somebody out, uh, but I'll take the privilege of being on my sort of uh, consecrated uh, uh, date buddy next to my name in the consecration, Bill Wantlin. Um, <laughs> Uh, Bill and I, uh, we fought the good fight, and along with ben Benitez, um, can you hear this? Yeah. Try it now. Uh, can you hear that? Yeah. Right. that a, uh, that um, Bill Wantlin and Ben Benitez and I and Alec Dixon, we were called the um, junkyard dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and and we, we did fight, didn't we, Bill? And, and we, we get to be close almost like blood brothers and I'm so grateful to be able to, for you to give me the chance to see him and the others together. Um, but even more so as a different kind of friend um, is Ed McBurney. And uh, I have such um, admiration for him. He and I were on the theological committee together. And I, w I was with Spong and Bosch, and, uh, and I was dealing with the doctrine, and he was dealing with witness. And um, he was not called a junkyard dog, because he was our spiritual superior, <laughs> I believe. Yeah, he sent. It went off again. New battery, yeah. Whoa. I think. Um, <coughs> While we're waiting for it, I'll just say a little bit about Ed. Um, it reminded me of a Texas clergyman that I can't remember the name of him, uh, but he was insisting of how teaching and witness were different. When you teach somebody, you preach some, to someone, you, you evoke a response. When you witness, they can buy it, I'm sorry, but his witness, he declared and to them, what he believed and what the Lord had done for him. And that was so much more effective than my tangling with him on the level of doctrine. Now mind you, I'm not going to give up tangling with your level of doctrine, <laughs> but it's still not to replace a time of witness. And I'd like to take the privilege of dedicating what I've got to say, if it's any good, if it's of the word of the Lord, to Ed himself. I talked to him on the phone, and he sends you all his very best. He's heartbroken that he's not here with us all today. Um, also, I would like to, to thank your president for what he did. I first thought of and heard about Christmas in July. My goodness, how quaint. <laughs> what, what kind of thing is that? Um, and after the Eucharist yesterday, uh, I thought somehow he's brought the vulnerability of the Christ child back into my life. There's something about the manger at Christmas that has already been taken over by the soci sociology of the time, by all of the things that are going on in Christmas. And we don't know when he was born. And why not have Christmas in July? And something about that magnitude of meekness, though the strength of infant weakness that Christopher Smart writes about came home to me, and I thank you for 
Christmas in July. <laughs> now, the change that I have made in this talk has to come out of my wife and I reading uh, Jeremiah and Hosea and Amos. We're in Amos now. But uh, I just did not feel, as you will see later on in this paper, that I could go with what I originally was going to say, and that's on the cutting room floor. <laughs> um, and um, having been married now for 66 years, I learned to say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so we start with the incarnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the Lord's song we are to sing in this strange land. To sing the song of the Incarnation, we must first understand the condition of the world to whom we sing. God's mercy is forever, or none of us has a chance. God's patience is not forever. God is implacably against whatever denies his love. His love makes him an enemy of apostasy and of idolatry. His wrath today is not altogether different from what is described in Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, and now we're reading Amos. Surely God is using Islam and secularism as the rod of his anger as he did with Assyria. This captivity is already beginning. Why should he not be angry with a culture denying his existence and his church disunited by schisms rent asunder and by heresies distressed? It is important that we understand two things about God's wrath. First, its true character and purpose is solely to recover a path for his love. Secondly, he often needs to do nothing but withdraw his Holy Spirit from us and leave us to our own spirits, and that's hell. Even John Paul Sartre, in no exit, understood that without God, hell is other people. It is as if God is saying, you want universities without me? Help yourself. The universities birthed from the womb of the church are now fast replacing truth with power. As well described by George Mars and Alistair McIntyre, Hunter Baker, and John Sumrall, and the depressing disclosure of moral and academic bankruptcy in the novel by Tom Wolfe, I Am Charlotte Simmons. The latter is recommended for its diagnosis by Mary Ann Glendon, that rare phenomenon a Christian scholar at Harvard University, <laughs> the Vatican of secularism. <laughs> Students are turning campuses into concerns for diversity which, whose specious unity is asserted by freedom-denying, politically correct hysteria. That's a mouthful. God is saying, you want democracy without me? Help yourself. We have helped ourselves by being given a choice for the President of the United States of America between two of the most distrusted candidates in the history of our country. God is saying, you want sex without my guidance? Help yourself. We are helping ourselves 
with a soul-destroying pornography, which is a much more pervasive and destructive distortion than is generally recognized. A lonely and confusing hookup culture, a glowing, growing culture of abuse, rape, pederasty, and in the words of William Butler Yeats, everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. God is saying, you want gender identification without me? Help yourself. We are helping ourselves with drugs and surgical mutilation rather than therapy for gender confusion and are in frantic controversies over bathroom insanities. God is saying, you want politics without me? Help yourself. We are helping ourselves by eliciting representatives, by electing representatives we do not trust and who express themselves in legislative stagnation. You want an economy without me? Help yourself. We are helping ourselves with a $19 trillion debt with no prospect of paying it off and a policy that discourages savings as well as looming bankruptcies for municipalities, territories, and cities. You want marriage and family without my, me? Help yourself. We are helping ourselves with no-fault divorce, serial polygamy, single-parent families, government prog problems, pro pro government problems that disadvantage marriage and defines marriage in ways that suit us. And what suits us is the decline of marriage itself. All this in spite of the widely acknowledged fact that civilization itself depends on the institution of marriage and family. Montesquieu, the great French aphorist, said, more states have perished by violation of moral customs than by, violating, by violation of their own laws. God says to us, you want science without me? Help yourself. Now we have what none other than the non-Christian scientist and mathematician Bertrand Russell describes as, direct quote, as soon as the failure of science is considered as metaphysics is realized, the power, is really, the power confirmed by science as a technique is only obtainable by something analogous to the worship of Satan. That is to say, by the renunciation of love. You can find the context for that quote in a little book called Guilt, Anger, and God that modesty forbids disclosing the author of. <laughs> Is God not saying, you want life on, not on my terms, but on your terms? Help yourself. Our sad terms are diapers to diapers, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. When the Sadducees, who denied the resurrection, rule the culture's hearts, when finally there is no justice, when ultimately nothing is fair, when goodness to which our aims strive are never to be reached, when sin, selfishness, tears, loneliness, cruelty, and death are at last unresolved, unhealed, unredeemed, it is indeed truly depressing. No Zoloff or Prozac can cure this malignancy. The Sadducean denial of the resurrection thus leads reluctantly to the pun, sad, you see.
<laughs> but it is important in our song to be sad in regard to the culture rather than angry when we look at this strange world. Surely this is the land where we are to sing the Lord's song. God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is a land not to be despised, nor followed, but to be loved. One of the verses in our song must be the good news of original sin. It's Reinhold Niebuhr's phrase. To a culture complaining about selfish children, inadequate parents, crooked politicians, overweight people, riotous teenagers, and scholars relinquishing any concern for truth and inconceivable atrocities, it can be said, what did you expect? This is only sin, and we have a cure. The song of the incarnate Lord. But in a world in which sin, if ever mentioned at all, is relegated to sex and diet, we must acknowledge sin's presence in each of us and in all aspects of life. T.S. Eliot once told us, to do away with the sense of sin is to do away with civilization itself. No one has made the recognition of sin so simple, so clear, and so irrefutable as Archbishop William Temple. I'll paraphrase this instead of reading it. He says, when we come into the world as babies, we open our eyes and we are at the center of the world. Some, the whole horizon just depends on where I am. I move and the whole damn horizon, he didn't say damn, whole damn horizon <coughs> moves. Some things happen to me that are nice that I like and I call them good. Other things happen to me that I don't like and I call them bad. So I am not only the center of the world, but I am the opposite of what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. The trouble is, I'm not the center of the world, and God is. Part of our song, by the way, I think that's a lot easier to understand than, than St. Augustine's original sin, that I believe. <laughs> but it's, it's, I think it's more easily communicative. Uh, part of our song must be that sin is ubiquitous and, and, and humanly incurable. Even those in a state of grace are yet missing the mark. We sing the Lord's song not as Pharisees trusting in our own orthodoxy, but as the Lord's forgiven, miserable, but repentant sinners. Now, on the basis of what we have seen in the prophets, and what we have seen in the example that seems to me to apply today, what are we to do but repent? And yet, the beginning of our song in this strange land must be repentance beginning with us. Repentance is a cru crucial tune in the Lord's song but its true meaning must be recovered. We have been seriously misled by the translation of the Greek word for repentance as metanoian, change of mind. Kittle's word book of the Bible shows irrefutably that in virtually every single instance of repentance in Scripture, it is not our minds, but our hearts that need of change. They are the, the in my concordance, one column can exhaust every reference to mind in the Scripture. 
but it takes nine columns to reflect the concern that Scripture has for our hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things in Jeremiah, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. In Ezekiel, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. Um, if you quoted by that wonderful um, lecture we had earlier this morning, uh, if you confess with your lips from Romans um, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And Jesus sums it all up when he says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and defiles a man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. We need not so much a change of mind, but a new heart, a change of heart. There is nothing in Greek literature like Scripture's emphasis on the heart. I am told that Swahili has no word for atonement because they had not had any experience of atonement. The Greeks have no word for matakaria, change of heart, because they had no experience of the revelation that was given to the, the Hebrews and the Christians about a heart being the center of our identity. The Greek teaching that knowledge equals virtue naturally assumed that the mind to be central, devoid of revelation given to Israel in the Greek language, it has no proper great word for the Judeo-Christian experience. An early attempt by St. James, St. Jerome translated uh, repent as to do penance, but the inference from this came to be must do good works in order to earn forgiveness and gain it. Although corrected at the Reformation, we were still using the inadequate Greek word metanoian, change of mind. This led to dictionary definitions of repentance such as to feel self-reproach, to feel sorry, regret, remorse, to change one's mind. And I urge you to repent, to be full of remorse, Repent is so much something better than that. And we have been misled. They didn't have a word for metacardia, a change of heart. Haven't we all experienced the change of our minds that did not lead to change in behavior? It happened at that table last night with me. I got a second dessert. <laughs> <laughs> I knew better. <laughs> And I ate it anyway. <laughs> and I paid for it. Haven't we all experienced that? Mark Twain observed how easy it was to give up smoking. He said, I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> but change of heart does produce a changed person. Ashley Null has shown us Cranmer's wisdom in the prayer book. Concerning the heart, what the heart desires, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. Let me say it again. What the heart desires, the will will choose, and the mind will justify. The prayer book shows it is not merely the mind that needs to change. In the Decalogue, we are led to say in each commandment, incline our hearts to keep this law. And finally, uh, write all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. The first commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. At the beginning of the Eucharist, we are urged to lift up your hearts and at reception to feed on him in your heart with, by faith with thanksgiving. This inadequate word for repentance has led to thinking that the issue is the will. This bad translation of repentance has led and yet leads to the virulent 
heresies of Pelagianism, Adoptionism, and Nestorianism. If only our wills had the power, and then we fuss at each other and our congregations and ourselves by saying you must have more willpower. Well, the will is going to do what the heart desires. We need a change as the scripture speaks. And as Jeremiah and our Lord says, we need a change of heart, a new heart. The title of Ashley's work, um, well, to use a word like change of mind for repentance is like taking a heart attack victim to see a psychiatrist instead of a cardiologist. <laughs> Ashley Knoll's work on Cranmer, Cranmer's Doctrine of Repentance, colon, Renewing the Power to Love. Unfortunately, the subtitle, although promised to him that it would be on the front of the book, was back in the pages inside the cover. It's too bad because the negative sense of changes one's mind that has led to repentance, meaning only remorse and sorrow and loss of positive side of metacardia, the promise of renewing the power to love, that's something hopeful. That's something by changing not merely our minds, but our hearts to renew the power to love. Isn't that more appreciated by you when I'm suggesting that we need to repent, not merely to be remorse or regret, but to renew a power to love. The change of heart by renewing the power to love recovers a gospel dimension to repentance and therefore only as, and, and seen heretofore only as sorrow and remorse. The novelist E.M. Forster claimed that Quote, of all means to regeneration, remorse is surely the most wasteful. It cuts away healthy tissue with the poisoned. It is a knife that probes far deeper than the evil. Our song was correct this impression. Mere self-reproach, sorrow and remorse is not the song we are to sing. But the Lord's song is the promise of renewing the power to love. This must be an essential part of the, long so the Lord's song in this increasingly strange land. Metacardia, not mere obligation, but the renewing power of love is a gift and it is a blessing. How do we sing the Lord's song, however? from a church that compromises the incarnational faith. It started long ago when the first Lambeth Conference was called, in spite of strong resistance of some of the bishops to the Church of England, many of the, these bishops boycotted the first meeting. Ten years later, it was an embarrassing fact that the Archbishop who called the second meeting was one of the who had boycotted the first meeting <laughs> ten years previously. Uh, po Professor Paul Vallier's uh, recent excellent book, Conciliarism, A History of Decision-Making in the Church, describes these events and shows the running theme of synodophobia, to be afraid of synods. And that is what prevented the conciliar movement taking root at that time. Uh, synods, incidentally, have doctrinal power. Uh, conferences do not. Hence, we have to call Lambeth a conference and not a synod. Uh, this timidity in regard to any enforceable limits to doctrine became the hallmark of Anglicanism on either side. On each side of the. Um, Atlantic. Ernest Barnes, Bishop of Birmingham, had no doctrine of the Incarnation or of the Atonement. He claimed that, this is a direct quote, men saw that Jesus was a very good man, so they called him the Son of God. Um, he was severely um, dealt with by Archbishop Fisher, who gave a stinging rebuke to Barnes in a speech at convocation. 
Fisher assumed that a gentleman, hearing his departure from his ordination vows, would resign. But Barnes did no such thing. He continued as Bishop of Birmingham. It was once said that the Quakers, of, of the Quakers, that their religion gave birth to wealth and was devoured by its offspring. <laughs> Could a similar statement apply to much of Anglicanism? Its religion gave rise to social standing and was devoured by its offspring. A similar occasion occurred in the Episcopal House of Bishops when several Anglo-Catholic bishops brought charges against Bishop James Pike for denying his vows to creedal affirmation of Christology and Trinity. Pike was rebuked for the tone and the manner of his denials, but not for the substance. It was not a gentlemanly thing to do. It is obvious that holding Christians accountable doctrinally is among the least popular ventures of our culture. But with the failure of restraint by the gentleman's code, is there any alternative to confessional discipline if we are to sing the Lord's song and not some other song? This is especially urgent when the content of our song is the only hope for our culture. The Anglican communion has been, has faced in these recent decades with departures from the acknowledged teaching, but both Archbishop George Carey and Archbishop Rowan Williams refused in each case to hold the erring provinces accountable and Archbishop Welby's actions are not reassuring. How creedal discipline is to be managed is crucial. We must not forget that we have no two-person trinity. We must make every effort to show that law does condemn, but that it also leads us as a schoolmaster and a custodian to the incarnate word, the subject of our song. We must acknowledge that the spirit with which we have often defended this faith has often not been a holy one. We must not tire of the, ne the necessary scholarly discipline to show the disastrous pastoral, uh, spiritual, and cruel implications that result from heresy and apostasy. Orthodoxy must be gospel and not mere law. Jesus, without his full humanity, leaves you and me unredeemed. Jesus, without his full divinity, leaves sin and death the final and last words. The new heart in true repentance can by the Holy Spirit give us graceful courage for confessional accountability no matter how unpopular that is. Given Anglican and Episcopal and Western pretension, it is an irony of biblical proportions that our apostolic encouragement comes from the third world, for a long time an object of our condescension. Like the Methodist Church of our, tie, our ties, especially in Africa, are both a comfort and an encouragement to not fail to sing the Lord's song of the Incarnation. There is a, however, a subtle but important difficulty about the doctrine of the Incarnation. I would contend that all doctrine is law. All Christian teaching is what we must believe. We must believe that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. That law condemns all those who do not believe this. 
the great evangelical doctrine of justification by faith itself is a law that condemns all who do not believe it. How does our Lord's song make doctrine good news and not condemnation? There are two functions of the law for Christians. One is to tell the truth about belief and behavior which inevitably condemns all sinners. As John Stott says, a dreadful function of the law is to condemn. But a more important function of the law is to be a schoolmaster or a custodian to, to bring us not to a doctrine of the Incarnation that condemns if we don't believe, but to a flesh and blood, sacrificial, personal Jesus. One of my sons is an engineer. He's built an astonishing thing. It's something called ferro-cement. It's scarcely an inch and a half thick, and it spans a canal 30 feet. My wife, she believes in the bridge, but she won't trust it. <laughs> <laughs> she won't walk over that thing. <laughs> Are we not like our, my wife? Can't we say, I believe in the creeds, and I believe in the doctrine. Do we trust him? I may be wasting my breath for people who are not like, but I'm talking to myself. Have I let the doctrine that has disclosed to me what I am to trust be my trust? And not simply Jesus. Time to repent for me and perhaps for you. It is not the doctrine we believe that saves us. It is that we trust who saves us, trust Jesus, and that's who saves us. And this is the flesh and blood sacrificial, not doctrine, but personal. If we Orthodox sing, singers sing only about Orthodox doctrine and not about the person Jesus, we will sing the right words, but the tune will be flat, off key, and not one we will, that anyone will want to hear. If we cannot do this, we can at least humbly pray for a new heart, a metacardium. To sing the Lord's song is to sing about Jesus the Christ, knowing that now this doctrine no longer condemns. There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The point is the soteriological aspect of the incarnation, the good news of salvation that flows from the, from the incarnate Lord is one of the greatest ang Anglicans of all times was, who understood this was Charles Simeon, 1759 to 1836. He was the victor of Holy Trinity, Cambridge, for 53 years. The historian Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay claimed, as to Simeon, if you knew what his authority and influence were, and how they extended from Cambridge to the most remote corners of England, you would allow that this real sway in the church was far greater than any primate. He was required as a student at Cambridge to go to communion, Holy Communion once a term. Taking this commandment serious, he prepared himself by reading the whole duty of man an anonymous 17th century moralistic but recommended tract which led him to believe that a sinner had no place at the Lord's table. This led him to despair. He gradually recovered, 
because he knew, although unworthy, he must go to communion the next time. Fortunately, he was given a work by Thomas Wilson, a high church bishop of Soda and Man, where he read about the incarnation in all its soteriological splendor, how the incarnation is unpacked and a salvation, justification, sanctification for us all. In Wilson's book on the incarnation entitled God Made Man, he learned that God did not merely reward righteousness and condemn sin, but enabled righteousness by forgiving sin. From then on, his ministry was an unparalleled, graceful song of the Lord. In that strange land of the 17th and 18th century England, it is possible to affirm orthodox doctrine, yet this is unfortunate, it is possible to affirm orthodox doctrine and yet miss the saving aspect of the incarnation. Archbishop William Lord wrote 327 pages in a book called the conference with Fisher the Jesuit, explaining how the English church and its reformation differed from that of Rome. Yet he never once mentioned justification by faith. And this was in spite of the fact that just a few years previously, Richard Hooker claimed that justification is the grand question yet, let, yet lieth betwixt us and the church of Rome. It's a very encouraging thing recently that the joint declaration of the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutherans, that the, the Roman Catholics have moved a far way from the Council of Trent. This is a direct quote that they've signed. The foundation and presupposition of justification is the incarn incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. Justification thus means that Christ himself is our righteousness. It is the soteriology of the incarnation, the freeing and saving action of God in Christ, without which the in doctrine of the incarnation is only an obligation to be believed. Generally speaking, it seems not to be given to historians to be poets. However, William Bright, 1824 to 1901, is an encouraging exception. He was the Regis Professor of Ecclesiastical History and Canon of Christ Church, Oxford, for 33 years. He was a keen high churchman, but he expressed this often neglected soteri soteriology among high churchmen in such a way that nothing makes the incarnation, incarnational Lord come more coherent and full of grace than the words from this hymn. It's hymn 337. It was because of the teaching of the incarnation and the incarnation itself that he could sit, begin this with, look, Father, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father. The incarnation has brought him accessible to us, even us sinners. Look, Father, look on his anointed face and only look on us as found in him. Look not on our misusing of thy grace, our prayer so languid and our faith so dim. For lo, between our sins and their reward, we set the passion of thy Son, our Lord. In an academic world that almost excludes the pastoral concern for doctrine as affecting real flesh and blood people, it is exhilarating to be taught a prayer by this quintessential scholarly high churchman, William Bright. The great liturgical scholar, Professor Foray, claimed that 
Only two people since Cranmer could write a colic. He's wrong. There are three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them is this man. I would bid you all to think of yourself and your metacardia. I would bid you all to think of your concerns about the people here and the people not here who need your prayers <coughs> as you follow me with William Bright's marvelous hymn, Hidden Now for the eighth Sunday after Epiphany. We don't usually get the eight Sundays, <laughs> but you can find it there. O most loving Father, who willest us to give thanks for all things, to dread nothing but the loss of thee, and to cast all our care on thee, who carest for us. Preserve us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties, and grant that no clouds of this mortal life may hide from us the light of that love which is immortal, and which thou hast manifested unto us in thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.